Great, thank you, Michaela. Um, and I just wanna quickly introduce myself and then I'll be handing it over to our commissioner who is here today and is going to um, help get us started. And then we will have a presentation and some interaction um, activities with our consultant, Andy Zimney from Employee Strategies. So I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. I am the Director of Research and Innovation for MnDOT. Um, very excited to have joined MnDOT about two years ago and to be working in the areas of research and helping to launch the innovation program, which is part of why we're here today. Um, and I just wanted to begin today by thanking you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today to learn more about human-centered design and to think about how we can start to incorporate this type of thinking into the work that we do at MnDOT. Um, as you'll hear a lot more about today, human-centered design is a creative problem-solving approach grounded in empathy. It's really about trying to focus on understanding the needs and desires of the public that we serve and to do some brainstorming, to do some piloting of ideas, to really think about how we develop solutions and how we co-create with those that we are designing things for. Um, those mindsets of empathy, experimentation, and empowerment are really fundamental to MnDOT's approach to growing and fostering a culture of innovation within this organization. Um, adopting an innovative approach can help us solve the challenging problems that we are facing today and thinking about how we implement solutions to improve the lives of the people that we serve um, as part of our day-to-day -day activities. And so with that, I would like to hand it over and introduce our commissioner, Margaret Anderson Kelleher, and to really thank her for taking the time out of her incredibly and probably insanely busy schedule to be here with us today. So we really appreciate her spending this time with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to her. Well, thanks, Katie. Um, I'm just going to check that you can hear me. Okay, terrific. Um, I am actually in MnDOT central office today for the first time taking a meeting, doing this meeting and a couple others uh, in many, many months. I have visited briefly a few times, but wow, it is quite something. It's a little... For those of us who've been away from the office, it's a little like coming back to Pompeii and seeing everything, uh, you know, stuck in time, including everything from clocks to calendars. So I'm I'm sharing that with you because I'm in a different location today, and the reason why is is actually the negotiations uh, over the budget have really sped up here over the weekend. So uh, I am here uh, on site today to be of service to the administration and the legislature. But I want to talk a little bit about innovation at MnDOT and uh, why human-centered de design is so important. So first of all, let's just talk about what's been going on in the last year. You know, over this past year, there have been over 90 COVID-19 in innovations that have been implemented by MnDOTers. Everything from electronic asphalt delivery tickets to online payments for billboard uh, permits. And while some of these changes might be temporary, uh, such as the visual inspection of special transportation vehicles and allowing outdoor dining in the highway right away that happened last year, many of the innovations are also uh, really being looked at because they've been so successful and staff are beginning to permanently integrate them into our business practices to improve service delivery. Last, and to that point, last fall, MnDOT actually formed an Innovation Technical Advisory Committee or panel with 34 interdisciplinary staff from across the agency and uh, working with the MnDOT in Innovation Consultant Employee Strategies. Now, the members are meeting monthly for in-depth discussions about how their experiences with innovation at MnDOT have happened, and uh, MnDOT is, is really working through thoughtfully uh, preparing the agency to have uh, even more of these innovations going forward. 
That that I think is a good transition to human centered design. And I really love this topic a lot. I've been studying this for a few years now and really find it to be inspiring as a way to look at the work we do together. So th the basic is that it's really putting people back uh, more into our design and creative problem solving. And it starts with people when you're designing for and ends with new solutions tailored to their needs. I think sometimes uh, I know I'm a problem solver. Uh, when I'm problem solving, I sometimes start with the solution and I don't really think through the impact on the person or the people. And so a big part of human centered design is that putting yourself in uh, the client or the the people, the group of people you're working with in their shoes and having empathy for them. You know, focusing on the human experience and what a diverse set of perspectives and disciplines uh, are in this human centered design process. The important part of it is it generates a lot of ideas and it can provide better solutions overall. So this session is going to work through the five basic stages to the human centered design approach and explore specific examples and highlight how you might make use of those approaches with your teams. Um, I think I'm going to introduce uh, Andy. Is that right? OK. So Andy Zimney is the principal cultural advisor and strategist at Employee Strat Strategies, Inc., a firm in Minneapolis that partners with leaders to build cultures that work. Um, over the past two decades, Andy has developed a unique resume working with business and nonprofit leaders, chief operating officers, and uh, Andy also has been a professional stage improviser and performer, which I think is actually closely linked to being really good at human centered design. Andy has led learning seminars, retreats, strategic planning sessions across the country for organizations from a wide variety of industries to help them clarify their priorities, to develop more innovative and productive practices and ultimately deliver outstanding results. And I think that is really our goal here. So I want to turn it over to Andy and I want to thank you for joining us today. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to stay, but I'm going to go back and watch uh, the recording of this uh, so that I can hear Andy talk about human centered design and I'll turn it over to Andy. Thanks so much for having me here today. Thanks so much, Commissioner Kelleher. I appreciate the uh, the introduction and the invitation to be with you all today. And I uh, hope the commissioner enjoys watching this a bit later, the conversation we're going to have here on human-centered design. Um, so as the commissioner mentioned, I am with a firm called Employee Strategies. Uh, we are based here in Minneapolis, and um, we partner with leaders like yourselves to build effective work cultures, cultures that work so that we can get the results that we want. And in recent years, especially, we've heard lots of interest from leaders at all sorts of organizations, whether they're public sector or private sector or nonprofit, uh, more and more concern is going towards how do we build a more innovative culture? How do we make sure that our organization is keeping pace with the uh, ever-changing demands of the folks that we serve? Uh, so it's a conversation we spend a lot of time talking with those, those leaders about. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, my background, uh, the majority of my professional background was as an organizational, <clears throat> excuse me, organizational leader. Um, I also have uh, experienced a professional stage improviser for the last couple of decades, and there is a lot of overlap between sitting in the conference room, trying to make decisions around what's the best, best next thing to do, and standing on an improv stage and trying to decide with the other actors on stage what's the next best stage to do. And it all starts with people, which is what human centered design is all about. I actually started a program about five years ago called Leading Off the Cuff that was all about developing more creative, more innovative leaders. So this is a subject, of course, that I am very passionate about as well. Today, we're going to be talking specifically about human centered design and um, human centered design. One of the originators of this way of approaching innovation is a gentleman named David Kelly 
uh, one of the most influential folks in the world of uh, human-centered design. Uh, David Kelly is the founder of IDEO. He's also uh, the founder, co-founder of the D School, the Design School at Stanford University. Uh, he has a background in electrical engineering. He came to this field of design grounded in engineering. He worked at Boeing for uh, many years before founding IDEO back in 1978. So he's been at this for a, a good long while. Uh, David Kelly has uh, been part of a lot of innovations that we're all real familiar with. Uh, he helped develop the, the computer mouse decades ago with Steve Jobs. Uh, Steve and Steve Jobs were good friends. He helped develop the iPad and the iPhone. Uh, he is also back to his bone days. Uh, this is a guy who was actually responsible for the uh, illuminated bathroom occupied signs on the bathrooms on, on the plane. So very simple, but uh, important innovations that we've all all interacted with. Um, what makes human centered design different? Uh, well, there's a few things and we're going to, of course, get into some more detail as we go through uh, the rest of the session here today. But a, a few key things right off the bat here. Uh, as the commissioner and Katie mentioned, human-centered design starts with this focus on human behavior. Ultimately, just about everything that we're working on, everything that we might be doing some innovation around is going to interact with human beings at some point. It's serving human needs. So we're starting, like the commissioner said, not with the solution, but with those needs, those human beings, uh, first and foremost. And you'll see how that plays out in the process here in just a little bit. Uh, Human-centered design is also a highly collaborative process. Typically, certainly if you went out to IDEO and saw one of their teams working on a client project, they have many different folks all collaborating on that innovation of how are we get from different perspectives, different minds, different contributors to the process. We're going to do some collaboration actually here today during this session as well. And then it's also very multidisciplinary. So uh, IDEO's teams, uh, folks at David Kelly uh, hires, have got a wide range of backgrounds. You may see folks who uh, are working on a project like a, a uh, new shopping cart that Target wants to uh, roll out the stores. And they're going to pull in all different sorts of folks. You're going to pull in folks with a business background. Uh, they've got anthropologists on staff. They've got folks with journalism backgrounds, with uh, aerospace backgrounds. They've got opera singers on staff, all different sorts of perspectives and ways of going about problem solving that they're going to pull into those projects. So at Mindout, of course, you have a diverse set of skill sets and perspectives and backgrounds as well. Um, Human-centered design is going to take advantage of that diversity in mindsets and dis disciplines in the innovation process. Now, before we go any further, uh, a quick warning, warning, like I just mentioned, this is a highly collaborative process. Uh, I could stand here in front of my camera and just talk to you, at you for the next 30 or 40 minutes, uh, but that would not be very much in the human-centered design uh, mindset or approach. So there's going to be some opportunities for you to weigh in on the process here, just using the chat box. So we're not going to turn on cameras or open up any microphones uh, right now, but I do encourage you to use the chat box uh, for some of the prompts along the way here. Jump in with your thoughts. Also, if you have questions that pop up along the way, uh, please feel free to drop those in as we go. I know Michaela and some other folks are going to keep track of those, and we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end. So if you want to get your question in there early, drop that in the chat, and uh, we'll be sure to capture those as we go as well. Very good. Um, let's get right into it. So as the commissioner mentioned, there are five basic stages to the human-centered design process. You can see them up on the screen here. We're gonna take a, a little bit of time with each of these and dig a little deeper to talk about what they look like, what happens in each of these stages. Those stages themselves are empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. So starting with empathize. This really gets us to that very first bullet about uh, starting with human experience, a deep empathy and understanding of the human experience. So when we're going about innovating, the first thing we want to do is think about the audience for this innovation. Who is going to be interacting with this innovation? What do they need? What do they think about? What do they want? What are they really trying to accomplish in this process? So this is all about curiosity. 
learning about those users. One of my favorite stories that I think is a great example, a great demonstration of what uh, empathy is all about, comes from uh, a gentleman named Clay Christensen, who you can see up here on the screen. Uh, Clay passed away a couple of years ago, actually, but he was a professor at the Harvard Business School. He wrote a very influential book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And um, he tells a great story. You can actually go on YouTube and uh, find a video of him telling this story himself. But I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the quick version of it. Um, Clay and his team got hired by a restaurant chain because the restaurant chain was trying to sell more milkshakes. And before they called Clay up, they had already done some innovation work around this. They had spent several months in the test kitchen, uh, working on all different sorts of milkshakes to find uh, the best tasting milkshake recipe they could. So they had tried ones with a little more chocolate, a little less chocolate, different combinations of vanilla, salt, uh, you know, different creamy flavors. They uh, had made them thicker, thinner, all these different iterations of milkshakes. They test them at the kitchen. And by the end of that, that uh, several month process, they knew that they had the best tasting milkshake on the market. They knew this empirically. They uh, launched it out at all the restaurants and guess what? Milkshake sales did not move one iota. So they were very frustrated, very disappointed in this. They weren't quite sure what to do about it. So they called Clay and his team up and said, hey, can you come help figure out what we're missing here? And Clay said, sure, but instead of driving out to the test kitchen at the headquarters, Clay and his partner drove out to one of the restaurants and they just sat down at one of the booths because they were really interested in the folks who were buying these milkshakes. How were they behaving? So they sit down in one of the booths and they notice some surprising things pretty early on in those observations. Uh, one, they notice most of those milkshakes are being sold before 8 a.m which was a surprise, right? Uh, they found most of those milkshakes for some reason were being sold through the drive through window, not inside the store, through the drive through window. And that for some reason, the majority of folks buying those milkshakes at the drive through window were solo drivers. Nobody else was in the car with them. I thought, that's funny, right? That's not what we expected to see. So they get up out of the booth and they walk outside the restaurant and they go stand at the end of the drive through lane. And anybody who orders a milkshake and isn't too terribly creeped out by these two guys who are standing at the end of the line waving them over, uh, they have some conversation with these folks, just some curious conversation. And the way Clay describes it, anytime they're having these conversations, what they're really trying to figure out is why, why are these people not buying this milkshake? What are they hiring this milkshake for? Anytime we buy something, we're not really buying that thing. We're hiring that thing to do something for us. So uh, when we go buy a new TV, we might be hiring that TV to do lots of different things, right? We might be hiring that TV to give us a better view of the, the football game. We might be hiring it to impress our friends. We might be hiring it just to fill that blank space on the family room wall, whatever it might be. What are they really hiring this milkshake to do? And what they learned through these conversations is that a lot of the folks who are buying these milkshakes had long solo commutes to work. They had one hand on the steering wheel and the other hand had nothing to do. And they just wanted something to keep that hand busy, right? Uh, they had tried other, other products to do that job. They had tried hiring a cup of coffee, but it was too hot. They couldn't you know, touch it for the first 20 minutes. So it didn't do that job that well. They tried hiring a donut, but that was gone in two minutes. And then they just had the rest of their long commute with nothing but crumbs on their uh, shirt and uh, the, the cab of the car filled with their guilt about wolfing down the donuts. But this milkshake, they could start eating it right away. They couldn't eat it too fast. It kind of carried them through the whole drive. It had enough uh, heft to it that it kind of tidied them over through to lunchtime. They didn't eat another snack to, uh, to tide them over. It did that job really well. So Clay and his partner get this big aha. They bring that back to the restaurant and suddenly the restaurant realizes this is not about creating a better tasting milkshake. That's not really what folks need. Uh, they, what they want is something to keep that hand busy. Hopefully something they can tie them over till lunchtime. There's all other sorts of things, right? We can make smoothies, we can make frozen coffee drinks, etc. So they still boosted their sales, but they found a different solution towards that because they started out or 
ultimately they went back to that focus on empathizing, really getting to understand and know their customer, their uh, customers and their users a bit better. So that's what this first stage is all about, uh, this stage of empathy. Um, like I said, it's about getting curious. So what we're going to do, we're getting to the, the participation portion of the conversation here, is um, we're going to do a little exercise as we walk through, especially the first few stages of uh, human-centered design here. And if you've, uh, maybe if some of you have had the privilege of being out at the D school or doing a workshop with them out at Stanford, this is a real standard exercise that they do in their intro courses to human-centered design. What we're gonna do together real quickly this morning is we're gonna redesign the gift giving process. Okay, we're not gonna redesign a gift. We're gonna redesign the process to giving a gift. I want you to think about the last time you gave a gift, all right? And we're going to do a little investigation. What, what are folks really trying to do when they give a gift? So just like when we buy a milkshake or a TV, there can be different things that might be motivating us through that process. Sometimes we're buying a gift to show how much we care for the receiver. Uh, sometimes we really want to demonstrate how much we get them, right? We really understand our kid or our, or our parent or our good friend. Uh, we see something that the rest of the world doesn't see. We want to demonstrate that in the gift. Uh, maybe we're trying to express ourselves with that gift that we're giving. Maybe we are, we're just trying to show off with how uh, big and extravagant a gift we can get. All sorts of things could be going on. So here's what I'm going to invite you to do. And again, share your responses in the chat. I don't know if I'll be able to see in real time. Maybe Michaela can help read off some of the interesting comments that come in here. Is um, Like I said earlier, I want you to just think about the last time you bought a gift. Maybe it was a recent birthday. Maybe it was Mother's Day. Uh, some recent experience you had buying a gift. And we'll kind of just uh, tiptoe our way into this. So we'll start with some simple questions here. Uh, in the chat, share with us. Did you shop early? Did you shop last minute, somewhere in between? When did you shop for that gift? Michaela, can you see the chats coming in? Last minute, early, last minute, last minute, a lot of last minute. A lot of last minute, okay, good. So that's, that's our Couple trend here. Michaela, if you can especially help us see the trends, that, that, that will help us here. Um, good, thanks for your, your inputs there. How about this? What was the very first thing you did in that process? Did you go online? Did you go to the store? Did you call them up to see what they were uh, maybe looking for? Maybe call up a, a relative who knew them well? The very first thing after you thought, oh, uh, whatever, birthday's coming up, Mother's Day's coming up. What was the first thing you did in that process? What are we yeah, going online, searching Google, looking at their registry, a couple going into the store, asking the recipient what they wanted, more searching online. Okay, great. We have one person brainstorming ideas. A variety of first steps there. Very good. Um, next question. What was your favorite part? From the moment of realizing, oh, there's an opportunity here to give a gift all the way through to giving that gift or maybe that process afterwards. What was your favorite part? Be as specific as you can here. We have one for wrapping the gift, okay. picking out the gift, giving it, identifying the gift, giving the gift, thinking about it, giving it one when they opened it, finding that right gift, crossing it off their list, the anticipation of giving, seeing their face when they got it, Good, good. So again, a host of ideas, hearing, hearing some themes around that moment of giving the gift, uh, also some themes around anticipating, maybe wrapping the gift kind of plays into that, right? Um, building up the, the production of the gift. So there's more than just, it sounds like, the gift itself, but there's some other parts of that process that um, are important to folks and, and, and energize them. Great. Uh, what was the worst part of that gift giving process? You can make one step in that process just disappear. Paying for the gift. <laughs> Good, On the flip yes. side, we have wrapping it, the cost, okay. trying to decide, wondering if they'll like it, going out to get the gift, worrying that they might not like it, time pressure, not knowing what to get, the decision process, waiting yep. to give the gift. 
Oh, okay, good. So again, some connections here to the anticipation. Uh, we heard some connections there between the sort of research on what might make a good gift and the deciding process uh, is a common frustration for many of you. And uh, this might touch on some of the same ideas, but one last question here. What do you wish was easier about the process? Reading their mind, shopping, mm. mm -hmm. deciding. Another wishing we could read minds. Great. Okay. Wanting to ask, but not wanting to spoil the surprise. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so, again, sounds like there's a, a value desire in there, and not just finding a gift and checking the box, but really finding something that's meaningful to that person. Want to have a process to understand that, get some clarity around that a little, a little more easily. Very good. Um, excellent. So, You've done a great job there. Uh, you were just our users, our subjects there, right? I was asking you some curious questions to get a better understanding as a cohort. What were some of the important things to you? What your experience was like in that process? Um, really, this is all about curiosity, making sure that as innovators, we're dropping our assumptions. Okay, it's not a, it's not a better tasting milkshake. Let's just get some understanding of the folks who are drinking the milkshake, the folks who are buying those gifts. What's important to them? What's their experience? We're not asking folks, um, what would you like to do to make the gift giving experience better, right? We're saying, tell me about your experience giving gifts and learning from that process. Uh, I'm gonna try, especially, I mean, we're doing a very crash course here, uh, but if these conversations are longer, I'm really digging into and looking for why, okay? So that, that part of the process is frustrating. Tell me more about why that was so frustrating or why it was so exciting and meaningful to you to wrap the present. It's interesting. You kind of lit up when you're talking about wrapping the present. Tell me about uh, wrapping the present a bit more. What's your process there? I'm really looking for um, emotions, not just sort of the logic goes, that goes into it, but the emotions. We human beings, we like to think of ourselves as logical uh, folks, especially in fields like yours where we're surrounded by lots of engineers uh, who are using our prefrontal cortexes a lot and making very informed, rational decisions. And that's true. Um, but there is also a very strong emotional component to all human behavior. Uh, even for us engineers out there. The neocortex, the most recently part of our, evolved part of our brains, where we do all that rational thinking, if it were a computer, it would run at about 40 bits per second, which is pretty good. Uh, the limbic part of our brain, where our emotions and our desires reside more, uh, not the rational part of our brain, um, but that more emotionally focused part of our brain, runs at about 20,000 bits per second. It's driving a lot of our choice and behavior. So we're very interested when innovating to understanding what some of those motivators and drivers are so that we can design a process that engages folks um, at not just the rational level, but also that emotional level as well. So that's the first stage, empathize, really getting to know, understand the folks who we are serving, their needs, their experiences. Let's move on to the second phase, which is define. Uh, this is where we're gonna ask some, some key questions to really define a problem statement based on what we've learned uh, to, to focus our innovation efforts a bit more. And uh, we're gonna try and frame this as simply and specifically as we can. And typically we might use sort of a Mad Lib sort of setup for this. So we've got a user, uh, we may even be very specific, we may kind of find a uh, uh, emblematic character who represents our most typical user and give them a name, needs a way to, and then we're going to define the very specific need that that user has. So for example, uh, with our milkshake story, it might look something like this. Max needs something to occupy his hands while he's driving, and if it ties him over until lunchtime, bonus, okay? Oh, what are the things we can do to help serve that need? They'll get us onto the ideating stage. But right now, we're just defining some of those key needs, those key problems that we heard in our um, empathy stage. So if we go back to our gift giving process, uh, again, turn to you, go to the chat box here. What are some of the key needs, the key problems you heard pop up from yourself and your, your, your colleagues here on the webinar with? Yes. 
Again, think of it this way. Our user needs a way to fill in that blank. What were some of the needs you heard? Knowing what to give. Knowing what Under, to give, absolutely. Understanding what the receiver would want. Mm -hmm. Concerns over well, whether people will like it. Mm -hmm. Uncertainty. Wondering if they will like it. Knowing what to give and how to find it. Good, good. Um, great. And there's a lot more problems we can unpack in there as well. Um, but we're hearing a lot of um, zeroing in on that need around needing to generate some good ideas that we feel confident are going to be a good match for our gift giver. We can make that process easier or more enjoyable. Um, that's certainly a need that I heard in your comments as, as well. Um, good. <clears throat> So uh, some of the surprising insights we heard in there, again, were things like uh, really enjoying the anticipation of giving the gift, also some frustration with that, that, that period having to wait, right? Um, all sorts of interesting tidbits that we're gonna collect during this stage or just still in this stage as well, get organized. Once we've done the empathy work and we've defined our innovation problem. And again, we might define more than one innovation problem, but we're gonna focus on one problem at a time with human center design for, the, uh, for this process. Um, we're gonna move on to the third stage, ideating, where we start brainstorming and creating solutions. This is a stage that is all about quantity, not necessarily quality. Eventually, we'll put our eyes much more towards quality. Of course, we wanna make sure that we've got quality solutions. But when we're talking about this th th third stage of ideation, our focus is first and foremost on quantity, generating as many different ideas as we can, as many creative ideas as we can, thinking inside the box, outside the box, on the edges, in the corners, um, all the different ideas that might help address this problem that we've defined. Often we'll encourage folks in this process to not just jot down words on pieces of paper on a whiteboard, uh, but to pull out a blank slate of paper and sketch to draw, taps a little bit more into that limbic system, uh, gets us thinking a little more creatively. So as you think about some of the problems we define, let's, let's kind of focus on that idea around um, wanting to have some confidence that we've got a good idea for the gift. What are some ideas that come to mind around how we might solve that problem? Generating good ideas for our gift receiver. Read online reviews. Read online reviews, good, yes. What else do we have? Ask those who know them best. Mm-hmm. Systems to track what people like. Catch clues from yeah. conversations. Catch clues from conversations, good. Online stores could make suggestions. Great. Love Ask it. them. Perfect, ask them directly, exactly. Great example, we're going from very simple, straightforward solutions like ask them to, um, uh, some of you were kind of pointing in the direction I've heard folks say like, well, if there was, you know, Facebook tracks all this information about us all. Why can't I, as a gift giver, get some of that access to that information and learn about what might be a really good fit for my, my, my grandson or my nephew, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> there's some issues with that, of course, but those are the sort of brainstormings that we're, we're going through. Those kind of big, wild ideas, um, those very small, simple ideas. We're going to put as many of those up on the whiteboard as possible. We're not editing. We're not criticizing. We're just trying to fill out the board with as many ideas as we can. Can. So if we were in person or had some more time, uh, like I say, we may get ourselves into some groups and do some brainstorming, doing some sketching, some drawing. Uh, you can see here, these are some worksheets from some actual human-centered design uh, workshop sessions on the same kind of uh, exercise that we're in right now, thinking about this gift giving process. You can see the different sketches that folks have generated here. Um, they could explain to us in good detail what the uh, ideas were behind each of these as uh, as they reported out from these groups. Um, 
get as many ideas out there as we can. So now that we have filled that whiteboard with ideas, we're going to move on to the fourth phase, uh, which is prototype. So we've got that whiteboard filled with ideas, and we're going to pick one of them to start that we uh, feel is worth pushing on to the next level, that's got some good juice behind it, feels like it addresses the need that we've zeroed in on with some great potential. And we're not going to rush out and build a finished product, of course. We're going to prototype. We're going to build a very simple, minimal prototype of that idea. The idea here, if uh, ideate is about moving or uh, about generating as much quantity as we can, prototyping is about moving fast, moving efficiently, being lean. This prototype may be barely functional. It may be uh, just sort of representative of the actual solution that we're gonna build. Some of you may have heard the acronym before, MVP in this context. MVP in the human-centered design world stands for minimum viable product. So it's got just enough pieces to barely function, but we're not putting in all the bells and whistles. We're not spending tons and tons of money or time on it. We want to get something that's functional enough for folks to interact with. Right. So um, again, here are some examples of some prototypes that folks have built in these sessions. Uh, this is where we're going into the craft cabinet. We're pulling out all the construction paper, the cardboard. There's a great 60 minutes story uh, that you can find on YouTube online that uh, they did with David Kelly and IDEO, where they were working on a new shopping cart and they've got all sorts of PVC piping. They're dragging stuff uh, from out from the, the, the storage room, uh, assembling these kind of makeshift new shopping cart so that they can interact with them. They can play with them. They might even bring them to a one of the stores and have customers take a look and interact with them. Give them some feedback on that prototype, which should be moving us into our last phase. Um, but this prototype phase is about building that simple interactive prototype that gives us a little more insight into what this solution might look and feel like how it might operate out there in the real world. Which brings us to our fifth phase, the testing phase. We use that prototype to collect some user feedback. Uh, this phase is all about learning what works, what doesn't work, what's got some real potential to it, what needs some adjustments, et cetera. So uh, a great example of this uh, phase, this last phase testing is uh, the origins of Zappos. Um, Many of you may have bought Zappo or shoes on Zappos in the past. Uh, I've been a Zappos customer in the past myself. Uh, Amazon owns them now. But Zappos was founded more than 20 years ago, back in 1999. And if you can uh, turn the wheels back far enough, uh, 1999 is fairly early on in the uh, consumer internet world, right? Online shopping was a fairly new uh, idea at that time. And the founders at Zappos had in, in, in a hunch that an online shoe store might be successful, but nobody really done it before. So rather than building out a huge expensive website and filling a big expensive warehouse with all sorts of shoes, what they did is they just walked uh, down the block from the apartment where they were hanging out to the sh local shoe store and they took some pictures of, the sh of shoes up on the displays at the shoe store. And they put them on a very simple website that they had built and, and launched that website with uh, some promotion, I'm sure. And uh, what they were really trying to test here, what they wanted to learn was just, will people buy shoes on the internet, right? For years and years and years, we would all go to a shoe store and actually put a shoe on our foot before we pulled out our wallets and paid money for it. This was uh, you know, taking a leap to guess that folks might be willing to buy shoes or clothes uh, or much of anything online. So they built this very simple prototype and tested it. And sure enough, folks did buy shoes uh, through the website, which meant anytime someone bought shoes in the early days of Zappos, when that order came in, they would walk out of the apartment back to the shoe store, buy that <laughs> pair of shoes, bring them back to the apartment and ship them to the person who bought them. Not a sustainable long-term business model, but very appropriate for that early stage where they were just vetting out whether this was a viable solution or not. Sure enough, it was. 
And uh, they continued to invest, continued to iterate, continued to prototype and test. So they had a very successful website and uh, business model. And 10 years later, Amazon bought Zappos for $1.2 billion, starting with this focus on human behavior, human needs, prototyping, testing around some defined problems that they had identified. So that's human-centered design in, in, in a nutshell, right? In this sort of crash course. We've got these three, or I'm sorry, five key phases. Um, now we've gone through these in a very linear form, but really these are five key mindsets, right? We're gonna walk through them in order, in our process, in order. Um, but really these are loops of behavior as well. We might get through their testing phase and find that there were some things that worked about our solution and some that didn't. And we wanna go back and build a new prototype. Or maybe we find that you know, the prototype, the test proved out that prototype just isn't a good solution at all. Let's go back to that whiteboard and pick one of our other ideas from the ideating phase. Sometimes we find that we haven't quite defined the most important problem yet. We need to get back to uh, the ideating phase. And sometimes, of course, we even find that we don't understand our users well enough yet. There's something clearly wrong in or missing in our understanding of our, our users yet. Um, eventually, when organizations really take this on as a cultural approach, uh, we're building an organization of folks who are using these mindsets throughout. They're uh, looking at human behavior and the needs of their, their users throughout their work in their organization. They're getting really good at defining clear problems to innovate around. They're building, they're ideating, they're brainstorming muscles around creating uh, useful solutions. They're uh, <clears throat> finding opportunities to prototype and test throughout the organization. And you do a lot of these things already uh, in your work, I'm sure, at MnDOT. Just about every organization is to some extent. When we focus on it, we're able to amplify the superpowers of each of these stages even more so. Um, good. So uh, like I said, I know MnDOT's already doing some of this stuff because uh, we've been working with the office of uh, research and innovation uh, a lot over the last year thinking about innovation and in that. And um, the Office of Research and Innovation has run some human-centered design sessions on real working problems at MnDOT over the last year as well. And you can see here uh, on this slide some of the positive comments folks have had coming out of those sessions, things they have appreciated uh, about the efficiency and the creative creativity of the problem solving that came out of those sessions. A lot of those sessions I know folks walked into uh, probably with some skepticism uh, around what, we're gonna start with empathy. Um, how does that get us to a useful solution? Uh, but at the end of the process, hopefully, as you've seen here and just sort of walk through today, you get how these different stages connect. Um, so that's your crash course on human-centered design. Uh, like I said, we do, uh, we do have some time here reserved at the end to uh, address any questions you may have. I'm gonna turn off the slides here to free up some screen real estate and we'll turn it over to you all. <laughs>